Good evening, good evening, and welcome to the 6.30. Welcome, welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time. Let me introduce us. We, this is Gary, one of our elders, Gary hello, Brough. Hello. And I'm Mark, youth minister here. So welcome. Uh, feel free to grab a drink if you've not already. Um, make yourselves um, at home. We hope you feel very we warmly welcomed. Do you feel warmly welcomed? A few notes, yes, you are warmly welcomed. Emma, was that a yawn? Oh no, don't yawn at the start. Don't yawn at the start, Emma. Um, Gary, what's happening tonight? Uh, tonight, so we're following on from what we started this morning. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Maura Leng uh, with us and she'll be sharing about her work as a palliative care doctor, um, but really her heart and passion to see a bit more justice in the world when it comes to health and healthcare. After that, she'll be joined uh, by a couple of her colleagues from Nepal, uh, Dr. Ruth and Nurse Manju, um, and you'll have a chance to get in with your questions uh, on the work that, that they're doing. So get them ready, get them ready. Yeah, get good questions, awkward questions, any questions, uh, that's good, yeah. Yeah, get your questions ready. Let's look at Isaiah 61 to allow us just to reflect on God's heart for justice. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord, and to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display, the display of his splendor. And verse eight, for I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be made known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this, this evening and ask that in all things you will be glorified. Help us, Lord, to put aside the distractions that we came in with and help us, Lord, to focus on you and open our, our minds, open our ears, open our hearts to hear from you and to be willing to respond in a way that pleases you. Teach us, Lord, how we should act justly, how we should love mercy, and how we should walk humbly with you. For your sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ailey. Good evening, everyone. We're just going to um, begin our service with a, a few songs of praise to our God. And the offering is going to be taken during the second song. So if you feel moved to give to that, then please feel free. But let's stand now as we sing our first song.
Father, we praise and we thank you for setting our hearts on fire for you. And we are here for you tonight to praise and proclaim your name. And we ask that you'd be with Moira as she speak to, speaks to us tonight. And we ask that your spirit would dwell in her and that we would hear your voice through her message. In your name we pray. Amen. Mike, going to be okay? Brilliant. Good evening. Fantastic to be here with you and uh, welcome back to those that were here this morning and great to see different people this evening. And it's a real privilege to be able to share with you. I've attended these, ser these uh, services a couple of times, usually been asked difficult questions on the couch by Mark um, and we're really hoping we will have a chance to discuss a bit more tonight. Today is World Development Sunday. My job is working as a doctor in uh, parts of the world where access to healthcare is very difficult. And to be looking at some of the issues that are there in terms of injustice and inequality and some of the ways that God has called me to respond, but also to encourage us together to think of what is it that God has for you to do Ailey, those songs were fabulous. Um, the words were amazing, talking about the earth needing people and saying, here we are. And this morning we focused a bit more on, in fact, the verses, the very verses that, that, that Mark read, which were the verses that Jesus used when he started his ministry on earth, when he was standing up for the first time in the synagogue and opening up. What did he choose to read? He read those verses from the prophet Isaiah. He launched his mission saying, I'm here to bring wholeness and healing that will be spiritual, that will be also physical and social. And in palliative care, we also want to talk about spiritual. And as Christians, of course, that's something we love to be able to talk and share about. But tonight, I want to think a little bit about some of the problems, and I'm going to share those with you, and a little bit about how we might respond but to start, if you like, at the end. And the end is this amazing promise that Jesus started his mission by saying, I'm here to set people free. I'm here to bring a message of salvation that is for the poor, for the blind, for those who are trapped in whatever way they're trapped to release those chains. And we know that Christ left the work of that gospel with us an amazing privilege and a challenge. He left the Holy Spirit to be the empowerment for us to be able to go out there and be kingdom people. And that's the songs we've been singing about. And in the last book of the Bible, we read this amazing promise. It's a picture of a new Jerusalem. The picture in, in the verse, the chapter before, talks about a time when there's no more crying and no more sadness and no more pain morning someone said maybe uh, those of us who work in palliative care will be delighted to be out of a job and we will because there will be no more crying or sadness or pain when that new Jerusalem when that new time comes for us but there's also a lovely free, a lovely few verses here in Revelation I don't know if you guys do you ever read them together would you read it with me we read it together let's do that then the angel showed me the river of water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And I want us to think a bit today about whether healing of the nations, that ultimate healing can start right now in the way that we can be as kingdom people in a world that's hurting and a world that's in need. One of my colleagues runs something called the Global Health Academy in the University of Edinburgh, which is about to host a conference on planetary health, bringing together animal health, human health, environmental issues, um, 
creativity in terms of innovation and technology because there's a recognition that we can't operate separately, that our planet really is in trouble. She calls it the perfect storm where we've got huge economic inequality. This morning I was saying that nowadays eight people have the same wealth as the 3.5 billion poorest. Try and think about eight people, eight men in fact, um, have as much money as the 3.5 billion poorest. So we have huge inequality. We have very serious environmental degradation, um, which I think you'll be very well aware of. Countries like Uganda, where I live, are always just beginning to think about, but we're reaching critical levels on that. As I'll show you in a moment, we have more displaced people, more people caught up in slavery than ever before in history. We have huge inequalities in access to health care. And I, I feel very privileged that I'm able to work in some of the places where health care is really not available. And the UK still tops the ranks of the best health care system. But most of all, I think we can see in our society many of them, this loss of purpose and meaning and hope and what is life about and is it just about what we can gain and earn and have or is there something deeper? Some of you may know this um, map. Do you know about the World 100 People map? It was actually designed uh, to try and think if the world were 100 people, what would be the balance for all sorts of things? So this is, you go to the website if you want to see more of it. But this is the world, I'm going to take some of these things, taking lots of issues and just saying, if there are 100 people in the world, how many would be like this? How many would be like that? So let's look at a few together. If the world were 100 people, this is where they would live. 61 of them would live in Asia. Just a wee number in Europe. Africa 13, the Americas. So that's where the world would live, in a wee tiny number down under there. There would be a lot of people struggling with access to water. 17. This is a fun one, I think. 30 of them would be, would be white and 70 black on this one. If I, I can't quite read this. If I can't read it right, then please just correct me. That's it. 70 wouldn't be white and 30 would, so we'd have a wonderful zebra that was more black than white. Ninth, computers is pretty dramatic, isn't it? To own computers, only seven out of the 100 would own a computer. Anybody in this audience doesn't own a computer? So you are in that seven, not in the 93. Air pollution, I had the privilege of visiting Kathmandu where uh, Manju and Ruth, you'll meet later, come from. One of the cities really affected by air pollution, like Delhi, like Beijing, um, people wearing masks. Well, if you look at the world, then only 68 out of 100 would breathe clean air. So pretty fortunate in Scotland. Food. There would be a huge variety in the access to food. And some people would have too much we're running into the problems of too much food or the wrong type of food, but many would have not even the basic food to survive. Money, I've already said, is so unequally distributed. And energy is one that we talk about a lot. I've um, been had the privilege of going to Gaza, and I'm going to tell you about Gaza a wee bit later, but they've, they've got a huge fuel crisis because fuel is not allowed into the country because of the various uh, political uh, challenges in that area. And so hospitals are having to close because they've run out of food, run out of fuel. Um, in the Ebola crisis, you saw hospitals in Sierra Leone trying to operate by candlelight. Um, and it this one's an interesting one. I don't know if you can see this, but 48 out of 100 would not have freedom, freedom to speak, freedom to express themselves, freedom to, to practice their faith. That's a huge number, don't you think? Yeah. And this one, it's funny, they've got a crocodile in this one. <laughs> but this is how many people live in fear. 
And it's suggesting that fear of bombardment, of kidnap, of personal violence. You, you may know that in many parts of the world where there's conflict, then weight becomes a tool of violence, which is shocking. And of course, this is, this is not just about other countries. All of these things are happening to people here in this country as well. So that's a wee picture of some of the inequalities when we look at the world as 100 people. I mentioned we're seeing humanitarian crises. So that's, that's problems that are affecting whole peoples. Some of them um, made by conflict. This is a young lad in a Rohingya refugee camp. As you know, conflict in that area, people fleeing for their lives from uh, Myanmar over to Bangladesh. This wee, wee kid is in Yemen, which is having outbreak after outbreak of cholera and some of the worst humanitarian settings at the moment. Let's pick the city from Syria. I mean, think of people that risk their lives to cross the, the, the Mediterranean, for example, for help. This might be what they're flying from in situations of just unimaginable horror. And yet most of those people don't come to Europe. They come to countries round about. And those countries themselves are quite scared because they see the numbers of displaced people going to other countries that are poor. The Ebola crisis. Uganda, since I've lived there uh, for the last 10 years, we've had four Ebola outbreaks that never got out of control in the way that it did in West Africa, and still took 300 down. Cyclones, a natural disaster, people are thinking is this climate change or not? Most people think it is, it is. And this is an earthquake in Nepal. And my, my colleagues were actually doing quite a bit of work looking at the impact of this earthquake on people living so we have these crises happening in our world. As I say, we have more displaced people than ever before, and most of them are moving to countries nearby. Some are coming as refugees. We have more people enslaved than ever before, which again is, is quite a shocking thing to imagine, that after all the fighting to end slavery, there's more people enslaved than ever before. Many of these are and some of the decisions we've made, and you can ask questions if you like, I'm an expert, but I was speaking to a lawyer in Khartoum. This is where this is from, just back from Khartoum, maybe wonderful Arabic dinner. But because of the decisions we've made in Europe to try and stop people crossing the Mediterranean, they're actually being pushed back onto the North African continent, and this is a slave market in Libya. So the policies that are helping Europe are increasing pretty hard, isn't it? Here's a place I've been visiting. It's a huge privilege to visit Bethlehem in Palestine and Gaza, the two sides of Palestine with the, with the state of Israel in the middle. But Gaza for 10 years has been under siege. There is um, a lot of political unrest. But in dealing with that, what's happened is everyone's got locked up. And I, I was thinking this morning, it's a bit like if when the IRA was very active that Britain decided to lock up everybody in Northern Ireland. Do you know what David would say to that? <laughs> you know, you don't look at lock up a whole people because of terrorists, but that's what's happened in Gaza. So you have two million people, most of whom were already refugees because of previous wars, who are now in a, in a place where literally there's walls on every side. And on one side, there's food that they've come to accept it from. Trying to live, trying to have some decency. The country I live in, Uganda, is receiving now up to a million refugees from South Sudan. Some of you might know that Sudan was one country. It split into Sudan and South Sudan, as you've seen in Sudan. But South Sudan has, at the moment, no stable government. And uh, my church in Uganda has a lot of links with Sudan and with South Sudan because members of our church come from there. And there's a million people that have come across. And so far, Uganda is allowing them move around, get some land, get some food to sustain, not a lot of money, and uh, we're going to be visiting quite soon to see if we can give some more help in terms of helping them with their food needs. So I want to be 
history section with this picture. Does anyone know who painted this? But it's a dub of peace, isn't it? It's an olive branch in its mouth, talking about, I think, that symbolism of people coming together in peace and being peacemakers. But it's painted on a wall that is separating one people from another. Therefore, preventing the opportunity to make peace. And can you see what the dove is wearing? The flak jacket, the target. this new plan which we're calling the Sustainable Development Goals. It's quite complex and some of you may know this already. There's a lot of goals. Here they are all here. There's one about health here. But there's also ones about education, inequality, gender, um, climate, uh, poverty, a whole lot of them. And they've used some really interesting words. They've said that the target is to end extreme poverty fight inequality and justice and to protect the planet all by 2030. Quite ambitious. Every country that's part of the United Nations signed up to this last year. And some of us are working with various of these goals to see what we can do, but they all link to each other. If you live in Kathmandu or in Tansen and you've had a history of maybe taking tobacco in some form or another and there's food pollution, you're going to have problems with your lungs. So these linking together. You live in Uganda and you have cancer of the cervix, which is the commonest cancer in the world, and yet you don't see as many goals because we have prevention programs. That's going to be affected by the fact that it's women, the gender issue, by access to health care, by poverty. Do I pay all the money I have to go and have the test that I have to go, and then I can't see my face? And so there's a lot of work to think of how we put those phrases I want to just mention are in these documents. Should leave no one behind. Rich and poor nations should be working together to change what's happening. But there's another phrase that says that these goals are for the poor and for the weaker. And I find that fascinating that in a UN document it talks about something that they find being revolutionary. But these are meant to, now we know that actually ultimately the healing of the nations is that one of six capacities so that God's good news and that healing is going to be. There's something very important as Christians that we can do and we can say in terms of our response to this peace movement. One of them is the area I work in, where we seek to look after and to be alongside people who are facing very difficult times, maybe advanced cancer, maybe diabetes, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, who have what we call life-threatening, life-limiting illness, looking at their needs quality of life point of view. Uh, I love this phrase, adding life to days rather than days to life. You can add days to life today, but let's make sure those days are for quality. So if we can't, and I'll tell you a story that illustrates that in just a few moments. Another thing we're doing is trying to look at one of these issues, and that is access to pain control. This map shows you where you can get pain control in the world. So the size of the country relates to how easy it is to get pain control. So you can just look at that and see there's a big problem. A big problem particularly in the Americas, in Asia, and in Africa. And I do quite a lot of work with both people on the ground, but also with ministries of health to try and see if we can change this. There's a much number of factors that contribute to it, but it's simple. about Catherine. Catherine's story is a wee bit difficult. So I'm going to tell you about her and we might, might trigger stories for you, but she allowed me to tell her story and actually chose her sister. Um, Catherine
have been really desperate to find help for this. It's very clear, looking at all the medical evidence, that the, the lungs have really come to the end of the line and they're going to stop working completely very soon. But no one's telling Catherine that at the moment. Her mum's a tailor. She supports the whole family, but she's been sleeping under the bed because that's what happens in many hospitals as well. If you want to get looked after, you have to have a family member with you. And so her mum sleeps under the bed, therefore it's not earning any can you see the cycle of problems? Yeah. And all of her family are nine hours away in St. Paul and Barney. She's been saying to her mum, what's going to happen to me? And her mum's been saying, don't worry, Jesus is going to save you. What do you think? Is that the answer? That's the answer. And when I spoke to her, after she sees her, I was she was telling me about some of this, very breathless. And she asked me that question again. In fact, she said to me, Am I going to die? Quite a tricky question for me to tell you. And I could see her mum was quite anxious, so I said, Tell you what, that's a really important question, and I will come back and talk to you tomorrow about that. Um, but is it okay if I talk to my mum first? And also maybe we can help you with the wounds on your body. So they agreed on that. I came to see her the next day. And her mum said, And the next day I came in and I said, how are you doing? Terrible. I'm a terrible mother. And she said, she's not going to see you again. Why are you afraid of me? She said, stop taking this time to get to me. Stop taking this time to get to me. Now what had happened to that wee girl is everybody wanted to protect her. Nobody wanted to tell her what was happening. But she said to me, I stay in this ward until I will get better and go home. I'm not getting better. Nobody but nobody would tell her the truth. And as a result, she stopped keeping her mum. She and Harley interacted with friends about her. And she thought, if Jesus isn't saving me, it must mean this is going to happen. In her mind, that made sense. You can kind of see why that happened. And so we then spent some time chatting about what would help her. Now, this was now the hope that came to me. She's a wee girl who thinks sometimes, that Jesus doesn't love her enough, doesn't, isn't going to take care of her. How do you think we would help a wee girl like that to spread the love of Jesus? Okay, so if you have a think, how would we help a wee girl? Are we going to have a theological discussion about why God allows suffering? Yeah. Are we going to give her a lecture? So one of the things we do together in Holy Ghost is try and meet those needs. So we did talk about all the things that we talked about the day before, but I said to her, what are the things that help you feel less frightened? She said, I like to go to church. She said, I can't, I can't do that right now because of the fever. I said, what do you like to do in church? I like to sing. I like to have Bible stories. She said, okay, we can do that. I like to listen to music on the channel. So we got a radio. We got a volunteer team that some of the guys here saw and were part of, who came and asked her for her favorite songs, but we also gave her ice cream and got her hair done. Uh, you know, it's, we don't just look at one thing for this wee girl. Do you know the song she said? God will make a way where there seems to be no way. That was good. So I think actually everybody else was so scared to talk to this wee girl, but in fact, bringing in that holistic care, the volunteers are the ones that came and they just did her wee church service just for her. She chose the songs, she chose the stories, we gave her a children's Bible, and it was an incredibly moving uh, time for them all. And that wee girl didn't feel frightened anymore and uh, died a few days later at the hospital. So she's very happy I asked in advance, can I tell you the story of Jesus? So that's just an experience that we can share. And this is a 
team that had grown up since he died for Rare in Uganda to do exactly this, a volunteer team from the church there working in one of the local hospitals. And can you see what it says on the t-shirt? Bringing hope, bringing joy. Because even in those situations where we think, what can we offer? What can we do? We can bring hope, we can bring joy. We have the resources of a community. We have the hope of God. That and that enables us to be alongside people who are vulnerable. It also enables us to reach the feeble. And so I want you to think a bit about what is our role as we will carry on this afternoon. Because we have this incredible privilege, and I really do am amazed that God gave us this role to be messengers of this good news. This morning we used the word ambassador. And all of you here have got a purpose and a plan for your lives. And that's going to be unique. But all of it will involve uh, caring for a hurting world. It will involve looking for areas to, to deal with injustice. It will be seeking out ways to are broken. And I know this church does that. I know you guys do that. And thank you for that ministry. I love hearing it as a mission partner when I hear the stories of some of the things you're doing in the community and this being the first season here. Um, and that maybe for some of you, that's going to be doing that in other places. I know, again, some of you have already done that. Maybe something tonight will trigger you to think about, could I be in one of those places where the these inequalities are? I'm very glad to be a doctor in a place where there's these inequalities um, because in my tiny way, they're balancing that out and I'm teaching as a doctor. We can bring, I think there was a song that talked about that, that who is God, what is love, and one of the songs we sang earlier. We can be agents of love and hope, bringing peace and making peace in the world. And we might want to think in our Christian time, what does that mean? How should that look? How should I get experience in that? I was, you know, a young teenager in this church many years ago, thinking, what would that mean for me? Now, for me, it was to train as a specialist in this area, and then to work for some time in a senior role in the UK to get the kind of experience I need to now be working with ministry to parents and university, as well as having the privilege of meeting people in the hospital. For all of you, it was something different. But can I just warn us a little bit as we just finish that there is a danger there is a danger that we try to go and help people because we feel sorry for them, because we feel somehow guilty, and we put them off. We put them off. But the real reason why we help one another is because we are all equally sinful. We are sinners saved by grace. We are called as a church to build one another up, to care for one another, to heal and to help a hurting world. If you want to read this through, this is not ourselves as Savior and people who need our help as victims. And that's very dangerous to do so. But it's important to, as, we, as we think of our responsibility to realize that actually the soul God that we serve is a noble gift, is our gift, and to fill that with the Holy Spirit um, empowerment, we can make a difference in this world and our generation. This is a tree, but there's a, another church group who called it a tree of life. They put lots of post-its on it. How were they going to be global citizens? How were they going to? This is actually called the healing, uh, the, the the healing tree, or the healing of the nations. So in this church, they put post-its all around how they were going to do it. So here are some ideas. You know, start where you are. Think of how to get involved. Gary's going to talk to us a bit about some of the bursary schemes here. Many of you have travelled and brought back those changes in you from meeting people from other cultures in Scotland and also being able to then change maybe the way in which you look at life here, which is fabulous. And Andrew here from Nepal will be part of helping us do that tonight. Get involved. Be willing to be concerned where you are to the world. And be the present people. Be the hands and the feet that will bring the love and hope to these situations that we care about. If you want to know more about the organization I work with, you've all got a leaflet. Um, go outside, sign up to our Facebook page or our Twitter, send us messages. Uh, there's opportunities to be involved in all sorts of ways, including visiting. Um, and it's not just medical folks who need some of the most helpful people have come as IT skills or administrative skills. So there's a lot of room to be involved. And we're working mostly in Africa, um, in the Middle East, in Kitimu, and in 
part two is a particularly heavy one. But I want to finish this with a couple of plays. This one is The Black Eyed Peas. I think you know this song, Here Is The Love. And this photograph, do you know when this photograph was taken? Do you recognize it? It was the time when there was uh, the, the concert in Manchester, Love Manchester. And there was so much, I watched that actually from Uganda, incredibly moving about sharing the love. But this was a real challenge, I think. Father, father, help us. As we practice what we preach, here is the love. And I think the wonderful message of hope for us is to say, God is here because of Christ's love in us. We can then love him. If you don't know that in your life now, if you don't know the reality of being loved beyond measure, beyond anything that you deserve um, by your Heavenly Father, there is going to be a time And there was a quite a famous artist, Justin Bieber, sung at that concert. Maybe not read all of it. But I just loved what he said in the middle there. He said, God is in the midst and he loves you. And he cares for you. God is good in the midst of the darkness. God is good in the midst of evil. God is in the midst no matter what's happening in the world. God is in the midst and he loves you and he cares for you. And I would add, and God is in the midst of us as we are the ambassadors of love it is, and whoever it is that God wants you to see his love, his presence of love in your life. Because if I go right back to where we started in Revelation, he tells us that one day, the white letter tears from your eyes, he, he casts them tears are wiped already. The feet of dancing and the feet of heaven. But one day there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And what a privilege it is to live in this One day, be in heaven and to celebrate um, the new feelings and emotions finally seen. So thank you for listening just now. I think we're going to move now into a time of questions. And you're welcome to pick up on any of these issues. The issues I've talked about with humanitarian questions in the Middle East, whatever, or how to get involved. Um, and then there'll also be a chance to respond and to pray a bit later. Is that okay? And relax, but not too much. <laughs> not too much. Okay, um, I can't see anyone over there. Um, we have a, a microphone that's attached to Mark. Um, so if we could take one question from this side, and then one from that side, and then one from this side and that side, and just keep your hand up there. Just one out. So um, I'll start off with one quick question, um, and then if you um, if you could pop up your hand. Uh, even while we're going through that, and Mark will, will make his way over to you. Okay. So, I'll start, uh, I guess we'll start at, at this end of the sofa, and do, well, we'll skip over you, Mario, for introductions. Um, and, but I would like to, can't hear, sorry. Um, so, we'll start at this end of the sofa, uh, passing over, actually, Moira, and then going on to, to Manju. Um, Manju is a palliative care nurse from Nepal. Nepal's actually only um, palliative care kind of specialist nurse, someone working with uh, with that as a, as a specialism. Um, but she is supported in her work uh, by Ruth, uh, who is a doctor from Australia. So we have a far-flung sofa um, who are ready to ask, answer your questions. Opening not that gently, we see a lot of the sort of things, Moira, that you were talking about on the news, uh, on social media, um, bits of, we just get little bits of these really horrific stories of, um, of things that are happening in the world, but they're far, far away uh, for us. I wonder if, if each of you might be able to share just, even just one example um, of people you've come across and what this injustice looks like in their lives. I can pass this mic along as well. Again, in order. Mm. 
Sorry. So, yeah, this news is far away. Uh, Manju, perhaps you could tell us about the earthquake in, in Nepal and following up with them, uh, with people who were affected by the earthquake, how that impacts their lives. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a story like, I mean, three years back we had this uh, big uh, earthquake in Nepal and many uh, family life uh, were destroyed. And uh, along with this, we got the opportunity to do one survey in main area, which was uh, affected, badly affected. And uh, the life there is, even after two, three years, life was uh, still difficult. People were still in the shelter. They didn't have, uh, still didn't have the um, a permanent place to uh, stay. And in relating that with the, their f health, uh, their daily life, they are like, I think it's more, they are used to with it. Because in last this two, three years, they have not been able to get the, uh, all the services, all the facilities. So they were left uh, there with all the difficulties and people were more like in chronic illnesses. And, and Ruth as well, is now, yes, three years on from that, the cameras, the news have, have gone away. Um, is that still a continuing, people still continue to live with the effects of the earthquake? Yes, the reconstruction has taken a long time. It's still happening. Many people are still living in temporary shelters. Um, and many people didn't have much before the earthquake, um, and they still don't have a lot. So it is an ongoing thing. Can I give another example? Um, we all hear things from around the world, and we're touched by them. But sometimes you come up very close to someone going through something very difficult, and it touches you enormously. And one of those people for me was a young girl living in a village um, many years ago who was um, due to be delivering a baby and the baby wasn't coming in the right way. And uh, so she was struggling in labour for about three days in the village and um, we knew the baby wasn't in the right direction and we were um, only about five hours by a very bumpy road from the nearest medical facility that, that could actually do an operation. We couldn't actually operate where we were. We were in a village setting. And we tried to encourage the family to send this girl for surgery to at least try and save the baby, whose heart rate was then very low. And the family, uh, particularly the, 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 fa the father-in-law, uh, said, no, we're not going to send this girl. We went back the next day. Um, and the heart rate was even worse. The girl was just distraught with pain um, and problems and the, again, the family wouldn't send this, this girl five hours, even if we provided the transport for them to go, they wouldn't. And we said, why? And the father-in-law said, if we send, we send this girl, we'll have to sell our buffalo. It's easier to get a new daughter-in-law than to lose our buffalo. Can I say, God did an amazing thing. And after another 24 hours, the family agreed that, that the girl could go. There was hardly a heartbeat of the baby and we thought the girl was gonna die as well. God's grace. We saw an absolute miracle. Both the baby and the girl survived. I can't explain that medically, except prayer. But that girl was so disadvantaged, so marginalised. She had no say in her life or her baby. And her family saw her as less important than their animal. Animals are really important. That was one person who had a lot of impact on my life. And there's millions like her around the world. I think it's a really good question. I mean, I remember that picture of that migrant toddler, the wee lad that 
that was washed up on a beach. Do you remember that picture that went kind of viral? And, and I think, you know, almost it was like we're overwhelmed with all the images and the, you know, we're, we're able to kind of see and hear. But sometimes it, it's, it has to be personalized, you know. So I think that that image was very powerful in helping people understand the experience of migrants. And I, I just want to tell you, but, but, a, but a, a young medical student in Gaza, we were teaching, we were talking about quite difficult stuff, we were having a lot of fun. Um, I was making them do some crazy exercises to test out various things. It was a really fun week. But what he said to me was, I feel more dignified because you've come here to visit, which I thought was really powerful. He was saying to me as a person trapped in this pretty terrible conflict, which meant that he really had no chance of travel or moving. He was saying that just by someone coming and spending time building his skills, helping him be a better doctor, a better medical student, he felt more dignified, and, and I was really humbled by that. Have there been any questions from, from anyone else? Okay. Um, you all specialize in palliative care. You all specialize in palliative care. Um, and that's one area of health where even the WHO recognizes that spiritual care is actually part of good health care. Um, is there a way in which, as Christians, you've got something unique to offer um, to your patients? Who wants to start? Manju. So uh, the, the hospital at the moment where I'm, I mean, in these days where I'm working, is a mission hospital. Uh, we see so many patients who are in the end stage, but at the same time who have long-term illnesses. And what I have experienced uh, going through the conversation, listening to them, there is a still a unspoken words, uh, not said topics or could be cultural or so many uh, affecting factors that does not really uh, give the freedoms to talk about death and dying. They do have the fear of death. They do have what will happen after death. Why, I'm, why it is happening to me. This kind of all the issues. But they don't feel that much uh, comfort or easiness to talk about that. So as a, a Christian, we will not directly, uh, you know, share or share the gospel or, uh, you know, being forced, forceful. But we, at the end of the conversation, when we do, do go frequently visit them, at the end they find something different and they feel the comfort and we are able to ask, can we pray for you? And then after... Uh, we, uh, uh, if they are willing, then we get into the gospel. I think, again, it's a really good question. Um, and there may be some people here who came out to Uganda and prayed with some of our patients that may want to comment on that because that's something you were involved with. But what I think is amazing is, first of all, we can be engaged in these areas, palliative care or any of these other areas that I mentioned earlier, because we have uh, the grace of God because we ourselves are forgiven. It's really important to be filled up if we're giving out, you know, and that's, that's the first thing. So as Christians, we don't have to fear death, and therefore we don't have to fear talking about it to somebody else. So I think that's one of the most important things. The second is spirituality is, yes, about a relationship with God, but it's also about meaning and forgiveness and hope and what's my life been about and am I leaving anything behind or what would I like to leave behind? And those questions in themselves and listening to people's thinking about that is spiritual support. So sometimes we can pray very obviously. Sometimes what we do is we, we listen to people's stories with those kind of questions. And in the telling of that, people begin to make sense. And maybe, maybe it's a time of real spiritual growth because the rest of your life, particularly in our societies, we're focused on what we're going to get and what we're going to achieve. But suddenly now we've had to think, actually, my time might not be so long what is life about? So I, I consider it a huge opportunity to explore spiritual issues with people of Christian faith and none, sometimes sharing our faith 
verbally, always sharing it non-verbally, and doing that not in our own strength, but in the love of God. In a similar vein, um, I'm going to pick a, pick on a doctor um, after my question. Um, so doctors, uh, be ready, each with a question. Um, there are a good enough number of you in here, and so I shall pick a doctor at random to ask a question next. Thank you. Okay, so um, I didn't say a doctor of what as well, so there's a few more of you could be on the hook. Um, <laughs> Moira, perhaps in particular, um, this when you, you presented some huge issues of inequality, um, things that just really seem insurmountable. What what keeps you going? I think that links to the one before. I mean, I think um, there's lots lots of things about that. That holistic picture we've painted for pa for patients applies to us. So we need to be healthy in all those ways, and that I don't always get that right, um, but to be healthy and to be full of joy yourself, um, and that comes mostly from a relationship with God, but also from the encouragement of others. I have a fabulous church I belong to in Uganda. I sometimes just get hugged for uh, the first 20 minutes. It's a very hugging church. Would you agree, those of you who came? Yep. And that in those hugs is actually love and sharing love um, and being able to share with others i mean this we find it incredibly encouraging being able to talk about what we're doing together and also the sense of being able to make a difference and um, so i think all of those those are aspects of that but i think too there is this huge need but there is something somebody told me once find out what it is that only you can do not what all the things that you could do because many of us can do lots of things. But what it is that only you can do that God's asking you to do? And being in that place where you feel it's where God wants you to be and serving in the way he's asking you to, I think is an incredible source of fulfillment. But it is tough. And please do pray for us. Pray for each other. Thank you for your support as a church. And um, please continue to do that because we do need encouragement, um, any of us who are working in these kinds of areas, and really appreciate that. The other amazing thing about palliative care is that we're multidisciplinary. We actually work in teams as much as possible, and that fit, fits in with keeping ourselves healthy, um, looking out for one another, encouraging one another. So I'm not a one-man band. Um, I have certain contributions, but there's others I work with who are part of the team, and they bring their own unique individual contribution, and together, God uses it. Um, and that's, that's fantastic because none of us can do everything. Uh, we can just do our little bit, but God puts us in community, doesn't he, wherever we are. Um, but that's something very special about palliative care that we really try and work as teams, professional teams, but also with volunteers from churches, communities, try and involve the families as part of the team as well. The patients are a central part of the team. Any other questions? Doctors. <laughs> and I'm not a doctor. <laughs> right. Or well, a doctor of money, maybe. Um, we've had Davos recently with the, the World Economic Forum. And I would say the great and the good, but I'll say the great, but maybe not the good, have been gathered there. Um, has there anything come out of that? Or over the years, has anything come out of those sort of gatherings by world leaders where you hear a lot of the rhetoric about the issues that we've talked about and addressing those and putting goals in place? Does that actually produce results at the coalface, in, you know, down on, in the field, as it were? Great question. Um, and I'm not a, you know, an economist, but what you can see is that there has been actually effects. I didn't mention that so much tonight, but for example, um, there was a previous thing to the Millennium Develop called the Millennium Development Goals before the Sustainable Development Goals, and that did show a huge reduction in global extreme poverty. It also showed an improvement in, in treatment of specific illnesses, and the ones chosen were things like malaria and TB and HIV. Um, I think what is difficult is 
how increasingly unequal. So the poorest of the poor have not improved. But in the middle, there has been quite a lot of movement. And um, you think about huge movements like uh, when, when we had Feed the World and, and the Bono movements and so on. They didn't raise nearly as much money as the World Economic Forum that year. So our governments can make a difference. I think the thing is we need to hold our governments to account. Our government here does actually commit a certain amount to international support, but it's shaky on it. And you know, even recently we've been talking, it's shaky on that. All of us working in palliative care are in a situation of really abject need in terms financially, because these things are not prioritized. So I think there is something about the prioritization of these processes. Uh, the World Health Organization right now is led by an Ethiopian. He's a good guy, actually, and he's really committed to this health for all agenda. But then you've got the guy from across the pond who's a wee bit loopy and, you know, says some pretty stupid things. And, you know, having just come back from Gaza and Palestine, all that recent declarations around um, Jerusalem, for example, were just devastating for the economy of Bethlehem this Christmas because nearly everybody didn't go and their economy just dived and nosedived. So I think that there is good and bad. I think there is some great things that can be done by groups like Davos, but please let's hold our politicians accountable um, all we can. And some of you maybe be those politicians because we need to use them for good and not for selfish gain. Here's, here's something to ask about. You, you've presented to us tonight the, the needs of the world, you know, and how are we as Christians to think about the world and how in particular are we to escape from that terrible oppression that we feel of not being able to do anything about it and therefore I'll just take care of my own little patch. I'll, I'll look after myself, I'll look after my family, I'll love my church, but oh, all this world thing it's just too much for me. How do we how do we avoid that and get positive about it? I think that's really key because we can just feel so overwhelmed we actually give up. We might even feel kind of trapped by a kind of guilt thing. So I think it's about and, and my, my friends will communicate, but having Manju sitting next to me is brilliant because she's somebody who actually lives in some of these places and she's a real person. You know, so, so actually getting to know somehow, be, I call it being a global citizen, somehow having some understanding of the world, speaking to people that come from places that are different from yours, understanding something of the lives that are there, understanding the things that we have in common and what joins us, finding out what we can do right now, where we are, you know, what we can do tomorrow, what we can do in terms of our politicians and our, our, our petitioning, maybe as, as the 630 group, thinking, what can we do and having some ideas. So being very practical um, and down to earth about it and seeing them as our brothers and sisters that are suffering and what can we do about it. And I know there's a tendency to say, not in back, my backyard. And we're in an environment at the moment that says, stay out, stay away. We want just people like us. And I think the church is an amazing opportunity to say something different, which is foreigner, stranger, people who are aliens, as they say in the, in the Bible, not as the ones in the film, you're welcome. In fact, we'd love to meet you and we'd love to share with you and we'd love to learn from you and we'd also love, like to share love with you. I don't know, Manju, you come from somewhere that is Nepal. What would you like to say to people like a church here? How can they feel that they can get involved? I, I would say you are already involved. Uh, prayer from here and whatever support you are doing uh, from your own side, I think that's, uh, uh, that's a big thing. And I would say uh, the other opportunities are also there to be linked directly, indirectly in prayers. Um, I think that's, um, that's why I'm here today. And that's how we connected, I think. Manju, you can um, piggybacking on on that question. Um, you're really an example of someone who got involved, has has done something locally, but your influence hasn't stopped in Nepal. You have taken what you have learned in Nepal, and you've been presenting it at conferences in India. So not just yeah. So uh, can you share? I guess why it's important for us to hear other voices.
Can I, can I say one of the things that's brilliant is, you know, when I spend time with people like Manju, is hearing a perspective, not of somebody who is, um, please, can you help me? I'm needing help. But somebody who says, I've got loads of skills that I would love to, to get involved with that. Can you support me in doing that? So Manju, I mean, when you came to India last year and you shared some of that work, um, what was the kind of responses you were getting from people? So I would uh, share about the uh, the survey we did in, in our hospital, uh, where we found uh, so many patients who are in need of uh, this service, palliative care. So um, going on that before that, like I think I can say about my, like um, how I got involved in palliative care. So it's. Uh, Ruth speaks fluent Nepali, so there's a wee bit of Nepali going on on the side here. <laughs> That's what you can see is happening. <laughs> Do you know, it's pretty hard, isn't it? How many of you could be interviewed in a language that wasn't yours? I think Manju's absolutely brilliant. Um, I think answer John's questions too. I think get involved somewhere, somewhere. Don't just have a nebulous thing. You know, I'd love it if half of you were, were, were just getting our Facebook feeds. We're finding out what M's we're doing. Um, get the information from people you trust. Think about it. Pray about it. Um, I took back Operation World. You know Operation World? To a young man in, in, in Uganda who prays all over the world. And this week he was praying for Antarctica. And I said to him, I said, Ronald, do you know that there's nobody living in Antarctica? And he said, do you know what? He calls me Dr. Moira. Do you know what, Dr. Moira? I just found that out, but they're scientists. So this week, I'm going to pray for the scientists. You know, he's a lad who's never left Kampala, and he plays for the world. So I think we can be global citizens. We can care about the environment. We can care about what's happening internationally. But get involved somewhere. Don't do it nebulously. Visit somewhere. See something. Speak to people. And do pray and encourage those who are already involved in global work. Our God is amazing, and our God is doing an enormous big plan. There's incredible challenges with it, but God is the one with the resources. So it was God who called Manju into palliative care and put that desire and that passion in her heart um, that she wanted to train in palliative care. Um, there were those of us who were keen to find people who, were keen, who, were, who had a, a love for palliative care. It was God that brought that all together. But Manju was so committed to, to that, she actually resigned from her job before she even knew there was another job to move to because God moved in her heart. God moves in each one of our hearts. Um, we can't solve all the problems, but God's got something for each one of us to be doing. And you know what that is because it, it resonates. It, it's a passion. It's something that's something really important for you. Um, and God puts it all together. And God is the one who's responsible for the solutions. We have to get involved, but ultimately it's the God who can move mountains that's going to make a difference. And as we as his people, as his community, his body, his hands and his feet in this world, get it, all get involved in little ways. It's, um, it's like that a person putting a little rock, a little rock, a little rock in a big swimming pool. You do it for long enough and you get enough people putting the little rocks in, you will fill the swimming pool. One little rock doesn't make much difference, but uh, God can do the rest. Amen, Ruth. We've got one question, I think, left. Um, I worked in Africa for 10 years, and God uh, led me there, and I saw a lot of um, sickness and suffering in Aden Bush, but God enabled and helped me to be there and to do what I had to do, you know, in, in that situation. However, when I came back to Britain, God gave me a vision of heaven, and it was absolutely amazing, and I didn't know that two years later, God was going to lead me into palliative care, which I then did for 10 years, but God gave me the words to speak. And um, it was immensely useful 
that I could point pe people to heaven. And um, he also led me to talk about Jesus in a very simple way. And I would say to patients, Jesus loves you. Or could you feel Jesus sitting in this chair beside you, holding your hand? You know, when they're gasping for breath, for their, their last breaths. And um, what I really want to say to the young people is, that if God wants you in that situation, he will prepare you and he will send you there. He'll facilitate and enable you wherever or whatever it is he wants you to do. Just another wee comment. I wanted to go to France and God sent me to Africa. I wanted to work in midwifery because I said general's too, general's too sad and God sent me to palliative care and I tell you I was very frightened about going into palliative care but it was an absolutely wonderful experience there because God was in it and he helped me immensely. And I did work with um, Fiona for Fiona? Moira, your <laughs> sister Fiona. I worked with Moira for a, a bit of time in Hunters Hill in the Marie Curie Foundation. 30 years ago, Moira. Wow. Well, I remember it well. <laughs> Thank you, Moira. Thank you. I think that's um, Yeah, just, um, just to finish on that, and can you just... Another brief round of applause to say thanks uh, to our panel. I'll be around after to chat to you as well. Um, and if anyone is thinking on how to practically make a start as well, it's a good opportunity to think about um, travel and whether or not you'd like to apply for a bursary from the World Mission Hub um, for a short-term trip. So, so do grab hold of the opportunity to to talk to these guys, to have a chat with me about how you could go about doing something like that. Uh, during the next uh, wee video clip, the, the prayer teams will be heading up to either side as well. And um, so if you are thinking on it and want someone to pray with, or want to pray about something else, then do make the most of those teams there as well. Before the video comes on, can we pray for you? Uh, Gary, would you pray? And why don't we stand together and um, show our support? Thanks, Gary. Yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of all nations um, and that you have a healing love for the nations too, Lord. Thank you for the ways in which you have um, equipped us to be part of that work. The very fact that you've given us an opportunity to be part of that work is such a, a cause for rejoice in our hearts just by itself. Lord, tonight especially, we pray for Moira, Manju and Ruth. Lord, we thank you that they have answered that call um, to be part of your healing work to the nations. We thank you for the, the gifts and skills and talents that you have given to them to help them to do it. Um, but Lord, we continue to pray with them, for them, that in the face of injustice um, against so much work to be done um, when helping those through great pain uh, and grief, Lord, we just pray that you would be every provision to them, um, that they would know your strength, know your wisdom and words, uh, and know your practical provision to, um, with through the resources that they need for their work. Continue to work through them, Lord, and in us, uh, help us to, to grasp hold to of this work and the things that you're calling each of us into. Lord, we are so privileged to be yeah, called out in service for you, um, and just help us to discern here listen to and, and answer the way that you would have us do, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God of justice, Savior to all, came to rescue To serve and not be served. Jesus, you have called us. Freely we've received now. Freely we will give. We must go. Live to feed the hungry. Stand beside the 
So just say thank you to those that have shared today as well. I think it's been amazing listening to the work that you are doing in Nepal and in Uganda and elsewhere. But I thought it might be good before Ailey leads in a final song for us just to pray for those in our own fellowship who are directly involved in health care tomorrow. Um, not everybody is here, but there are a number of folks here who will be standing beside the broken and seeking to bring something of God's wholeness into those in our community tomorrow morning. And so if you're involved in health care in any way whatsoever uh, in our local community, would you just stand now? I'm just going to ask maybe two or three standing around you just to pray for you. If you don't know the person standing, just ask their name. And we'll just take a couple of minutes just to pray for those involved in health care ourselves. So if you're involved, would you like to stand just now? I'm not going to ask you to ask a question or anything of that. Okay. Right, we'd, we'd need probably <laughs> a crowd of people down the back there. There's four standing up down there. Is that okay? And, and also for those that were taking part as well. Folks, you might need to move. There are folks down the back here as well. Is that all right? Okay. So if you're involved, um, that would be great. Just take a moment just to, to pray. And um, then in a couple of minutes, Ailey will lead us in a final song. And uh, even if you're not praying directly, you know many of these people um, and just pray for them privately just where you're sitting.
feel free to keep praying. We're just going to end our service in response to the amazing things that we've heard. So let's stand and sing. and we thank you that one day there will be no more darkness or pain in our world. But we pray now that we would be beacons of light for you, shining in the darkness for your glory. Help us to hear your calling and to respond to the need which is all around us, both here where we live and across the world as well, each and every day. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Again, just another chance to say a huge uh, thank you to Moira, to Manju, to Ruth. Um, and really, I do mean a huge thank you, uh, a huge and loud thank you. We stand, end that song in Christ alone, and you we stand, we stand 
with you guys in the work that you are doing. We stand praying with you uh, in the work that you are doing. But right now, we sit cheering for you uh, in the work that you do. Please do take the chance to follow up conversation. I'm sure, yes, we're getting nods, yes, big nods. So if you'd like to continue the conversation, then I'm getting pointed to the stand at the back. There's an African baoba tree in the back. Oh, the fruit, not just the tree, the fruit. Um, <laughs> yes, make sure you don't leave without tasting the fruit of the baoba tree. Thank you. And don't miss next week. Next week we are continuing our series in Philippians chapter 2 and I'm speaking. Don't miss it. We'll see you there. We'll be taking a register. See you next week.